Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back. We're back in the studio. And, uh, well, let's introduce the usuals. To my left, we have... Lord Mahazi, Yasu. <laughs> Lord Mahazos. <laughs> Mahazis. <laughs> Jerome. And to my right, Gavin Denise, a.k.a. Gezim. Okay. Now, we have probably... One of the most unique guests I think we're ever going to have on because of, I guess, his profession, but also what you've seen. I was saying to the boys before that this man is probably the best fly on the wall in the world because you've been around so many situations. But we'll get to them. Ladies and gentlemen, Gido. Thanks for having me, boys. <laughs> What's your last name, bro? Or do you don't want to share that? No, nah, I don't want to share that. Okay. We'll keep that secret. Okay, straight. Right, I'm going to say Guido because I'm Greek. You can say it however Guido. you want. You can say it however the fuck you want to say it. Um, bro, for the people that don't know, I barely even know, what do you do? I was the kit man at Melbourne Victory. For how long? Oh, 10, 11 years. Okay. He was asking me, Jerome was asking me this last night. Which season did you come in? I don't, I don't actually know. I didn't actually so I know. Started, I started at the club season two. So that was around 2007. Um, and my first, well, I actually got the job around 2012. Wait, how's that work? I was... I volunteer. I was, I volunteer for five years. For, yeah. Wait, 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 wait. For like four years. <laughs> Sorry, let me. So take, there's got to be some back pay there, Melbourne Victory. Let me let me interject, <laughs> you tight asses. Um, were you volunteering as the kit man for five years? So I was, yes and no. So I was helping out, I guess. Okay. In between school and school holidays. Yep. Um, but well, you're in high school when this was happening. I was in high school. I was yeah, year seven. When I sort of you started. You said that? What, yes. bro? I didn't Gido, even I, know this. See where I'm pointing out. Can I ask, too. how did you get involved, firstly? Uh, so we used to go to games with my dad all the time. And we'd get to games. We'd get to the stadium like two hours before the game. And we would stay back two hours after. See the players, see the staff. And I just started getting to know the boys. They got to know me a little got more involved, I guess, going into, like, functions, this and that. And then that turned into going to training sessions and just asking the coaches if I could help out. And Did they have a kit man at the time? Uh, yeah. I think when it... Gaz? I mean, no, no, no. Gaz came, Gaz came a lot, lot after. Oh. Um, there was, obviously, Slami Sivic. He was yeah. there around at the time. And he was sort of for the... At the very start, it was when Broxy was still sort of doing doing the role. Still DJing. Um, so you're in year seven. You're hanging around the club, Olympic Park days. Everyone's getting to know you and they're probably thinking, who is this kid? But then what makes the official move for you to go on board at the club? Like when was the time when they said, come in and help out or you asked? I don't know how it went. Um. It was a little bit like a Stephen Bradbury moment, actually, because sort of I finished high school and Ange was the coach at the time and he thought I was too young to do the job. And I was, <laughs> oh, I was like you, 17, <laughs> 18. And I, and I, I, was, I was devastated. And the guy that was doing it left and I thought, all right, you know, this is my moment. And uh, anyway, they brought someone in. And... Um, he lasted, I think, about three months. And they were now in season and I was the only one that kind of knew how to do the job. So they settled to stay on board for a month. And a month became two, two months became three, and three months became ten years. So before Ange, you were just at the club, what, helping helping around? Or yeah. were you actual kit man? No, I was just sort of like helping around. Okay, at Doing training. the kit, yeah, like doing okay. the kit. Just helping, you know, there was actually, I would say maybe a period of two, three months where I pretty much nearly did the job. Either was that because 
your love for football, love for the club, or how? What was your reasoning for getting so involved? A bit of all, a bit yeah. of everything, really. I mean, I, I love the club. I fell in love with it from from the very first match I went to, and I wanted to work in football since yeah. I was, you know, as long as I can remember. Yeah. Um, and yeah, it was just pretty much just hanging on, knowing that the opportunity was going to come. Yeah. Is that lost on younger kids these days? That want everything, and I, I'm des- um, I'm um, guilty of it. They want everything handed on a platter, or they just want to go online, apply for a job, and get it. Like, I don't know if if you told many kids you'd have to do five years of volunteer work whilst trying to do VCE. I'm assuming that's hard. Do you, do you think positions like that even pop up anymore for for clubs? Because I feel like everything now is super professional. Are they letting in young kids to just? Come and volunteer like you were. Yeah, I don't think it would. I don't think it would happen anymore. No. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I think definitely there was definitely a shift in that mentality a little bit. Yeah. Um, you know, we kind of sort of did whatever it took to try and even just get a look in. Um, whereas I think now, through maybe internship programs, yep. everyone sort of <coughs> just wants to come on and, you know, I want my initials on my shirt and where are the boots coming in or tickets for games and that without sort of. Like I think a lot of the, especially in the early years, it was, it was about proving yourself yep. and earning the respect of the bo- of the boys. You know, being allowed in the change room. You know that they were all little signs of, you know, respect that you had to earn of everybody from working and doing the jobs that they did when they were coming up. That's another thing. A lot of a lot of new footballers say. Oh, sorry, a lot of footballers, maybe 30 and up, would say when we were in academies, we were washing the seniors' boots. We were cleaning up the change rooms. That doesn't happen now. No way. If you go to, if you go to any of the A-League academies or whatever or any, any club in NPL, they're not cleaning up the seniors' change rooms. Did you ever have to do stuff like that when you were young, young? But you weren't in an academy. I don't remember. No, I wasn't. Yeah, probably wasn't involved in any. Maybe a bit older than us. I, I don't think I did that stuff, but definitely there was stuff where – like you would remember this when we would go on away trips, the older players would leave and the younger boys would do the, put the, the luggage onto the onto the thing the carousel. You know, so there's little things, but yep. not probably to the level of like the Roy Keane eras and stuff yeah. like that. I don't think so. Like when 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 I first started, there was always maybe a group of about four or five youth team players that were training every day. Yep, and they would have to help. Set up for training, fill up drink bottles, pump up balls, yeah. and at the end of the days, the boys would leave literally just piles of boots. Oof. And they oh, would, so they would do that. Yeah, and they would in the showers after training. The young boys would have to sort of clean, that would clean, stink. All, clean all the boys' boots. Yeah, Archie's boots would stink. <laughs> <laughs> Love you, Arch. Um, right, so I got a I got a question here that I think a lot of people want an answer to. They might think they know what it involves, but um. Guido, what is a kit man and what does a day-to-day of the kit man look like? Obviously, people know that, okay, you, you prepare the kits for the people, but what else goes into the job? Uh, because people, it sounds easy. It sounds easy. I'm on uh, footballjobs.com and Aston Villa want an assistant kit man and I think I can just, oh, I'll just move to England and go be a fucking kit man for Aston Villa. No, I don't think it's that easy. I think it's one of the most stressful jobs at the club. So, give us sort of a general meaning of what it is to be a kit man. I think it's actually one of the most... Um, I think it's an undervalued job, actually, yep. in, yeah, in, in a football team. And I think there's a huge misconception of what actually goes into the job. Like, I get it all the time. Oh, man, it's my dream job. I want to do this. I want to do that. And I'm like, well, come see Try and last a week, you know, do the <laughs> job for a week and then we can, we'll see. But um, literally it's everything and anything, really. We're like, you know, you, there's days where you end up looking after kids, you know, like as a play, I might bring one of his kids in because, really? you know, they can't make childcare that, that morning <laughs> and then they bring him in and then they dump him in the kid room and, you know, you got to, and then you take him out to training. And, but it's literally everything and anything. I don't think there's actually... Something Nothing's off limits. No, we haven't done. There's nothing off limits. Yeah. Well, I you was going to say, like, probably it's one of those jobs where if there's any task that doesn't directly fall under someone else's role, then it'd be expected or you yeah, would just put your hand yeah. up and be like, I'll, I'll sort it out. I'll take care of it. 
Yeah, like yeah. we've done everything, like literally from setting up like the master room for lunch yeah. and picking lunch up to, you know, then you're dealing with like, for example, like Liverpool and helping them sort out equipment for a training session or, you know, you're dealing with hotels and flights and weight limits and measurements of logos for certain competitions and... So are you... That's I, I didn't even think of that stuff. I think even from my perspective, on certain teams that I've been at, right, as a player's, player's view, is the kit man can actually make the change room so much better or feel so much more at home. So if you walk in and it's game day and your kit's set up, the shorts are there, your socks are out, everything's done for you, it takes that pressure off as a player and be like, all right, kit man sorted it out for me, I feel relaxed, everything's set up. And then you've been at clubs that don't have a kit man that puts that value in, you feel, oh, I've got to do a bit more. Oh, Gab, sorry, I forgot your socks, mate. <laughs> yeah, you know what I mean? It takes <laughs> yeah. that stress off in those things. Or even like yeah. certain clubs, they'll do all your washing, you know? Mm. And then at MPL level, you're washing, you're doing washing every second day, you know? So I think in those terms of the higher level you kind of play at, the better it is also, you know? So, and that's a good point because I know for a fact that as a Chelsea fan, uh, especially, I don't know if he's still there, but one of the, uh, the kit mans there was like the life of the change room. Yeah. And I know Man City have a similar situation um, with theirs. Um, but let's break it down. So train in terms of just the kit stuff or just the gear, what does a training day look like? And then what does a game day look like for you? Let's leave out, uh, you know, people bringing their kids and saying, oh, daddy daycare. Let's talk about what a training day and a game day looks like for a kit man. So training will normally begin around maybe sort of seven o'clock in the morning. Yep. Just <clears throat> sort of opening everything up, making sure... Everything sort of set up. Um, then it mostly sort of then translates just getting ready for training. So doing like drink bottles, pumping up the balls, making sure that all the equipment that the staff need for training is, is loaded on the buggies or vans and ready to be taken out. Um, then you go out to training. A lot of my time at Victory, we were responsible for the flow of training. So moving, so setting up drills, moving stuff around, making sure that the team could sort of go from point A to point B without any type of disruption. Yep. Um, then tra af after training, you know, mostly spent sort of getting ready then for the morning after. So uh, let me correct me if I'm wrong here and I've got no idea, but were the players bringing their training kits from home? No. So you had we, it all we sorted set out. everything. Yeah. Okay, so, so they come into Amy so Park. So they come into Amy Park and they've got a full set of training kit, undergarments, yep. socks, whatever. Now, how does it work with players and their uh, preferences in terms of like? Because I've heard that um, some players are real divas about what they need, and then others are just like, yeah, just whatever the training kit, whatever. So what type of things do players ask for? When you are laying out their, their training gear and all that, are there specific things that they ask for? Uh, training is not so bad yep. compared to match day. Okay, we'll go with match day. But on match day, you're talking, it'll be players that would change completely, like complete skins, socks, shorts at halftime, for example. And that's got to be fair for them. Well, each week they would request to change, <coughs> you mean? At halftime, yeah. What? So, like, for example, we, we, have, we had a player that he would get changed every sort of... So he would come in and put an outfit on to stretch and then he would put an outfit on for the warm-up. New. New, completely new. And then he'd get changed yeah, for the first half and at halftime he'd get changed again. So Can you we say who this is? So what the... F oh, no, don't worry. No, no, <laughs> we'll, sorry. We'll, yeah, don't worry. It was a marquee we'll, signing, but it's all right. <laughs> not even, not even. I oh, wasn't? Not even. Oh, <laughs> so Can, annoying. Oh, that mate. sounds like Honda we, or we, something. We, yeah, and like he'd... <laughs> He'd to take, be fair, you like John Terry, apparently he changes boots. He's every, like that, yeah. 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 Well, he's allowed. He's the best centre-back ever. <laughs> he would take six, seven pairs of boots. We used to, I used to laugh with him because I used to take a bag just for him. Just, it would just be all his stuff. Because this and is the other thing. When you go, um, when you go away, you, take stuff, you, you used to take the stuff, didn't you? Yeah, everything. Right. Boots, boots, runners, slides. Are they just in big duffel bags? What yeah. Just big yeah, double like bags. Cricket bags. Metal ones, yeah. Yep. 
Cri- no, no, okay. we don't know. <coughs> cricket no, ones. Yeah. yeah. Cricket ones, yeah. So that that's so that would be sort of the most uh not I don't want to say difficult because it's your job, but that would be the most sort of particular thing that you've dealt with that player wanting to change for every single action, basically. Yeah, yeah. So I mean you sort of just get to know what everyone wants and you just remember it. It's yeah. sort of unique. You know, you sort of everything is so unique that you remember it. For that player, if that makes sense. Is it down and to the point where it's like, do they just come and tell you, hey, Guido, um, I'm going to need um, three pairs of socks this week, not two? Does it get like that? It wouldn't be a week-to-week basis. Okay. A lot of the boys were routine-based, so they would yeah. have the same thing every week. Yep. But it could be as, like, we would even, I remember we would even do even, like, pre-game Barocas. You knew which player. There would be, yeah. like, we had it, like, for example, Reese Williams would have a Barocca before the game. In a little Powerade cup, whereas Broxy would have one in a bottle, and that and you just and, put it there for and him. and yeah. Mm. Can I yeah. ask you either what is the weirdest request you've had? Uh, we had a player that we had to make custom socks for. We had to get them sent in from Germany because <laughs> the ones that we used cost blisters. Because remember, we used to wear uh, match socks for yeah. training. Yeah, with yeah. Shin pants. Yeah. So we had to get. These custom made. He was an Adidas athlete. Uh, then we had a player that we'd have to put out four shirts every game, like two small, two medium. What? And he would. <laughs> <laughs> what? <laughs> and so the thought, the thought process was that he was lost he bulking at half time. Lo- <laughs> the opposite. <laughs> so he, he reckoned that he lost enough weight in the first half Fuck. that would warrant a complete size change. Bro, and he, he would he would in the change room he'd sort of try them on before the game, and if he felt like he fit into the small, but he never fit it. I would always see. <laughs> he just has IBS. Oh, I'm, <laughs> a bit, I'm a bit kilos over. Give me a large today. But this is the other thing because you're dealing with more. I'll be with an S. footballers, yeah. and they're so annoying. Yeah, they're the worst. And they're so like <laughs> privileged as well yeah. to some extent, like. Some of them don't come from privilege, definitely not. But like once they get to a certain level, they start to think in this real, oh, because I'm playing at this level, I can ask for anything and everything. Funnily enough, the guys that played at the highest level were the ones that were easier to deal with. Wow. Because they knew what they wanted. They knew what um, what they did. So they were the easy, it was the players that sort of when you perhaps were weren't at the level. Yeah. And they would struggle a lot more with what they wanted, and there'd be a yeah, consistent or something. Gilo, I wanted to ask: over the ten years that you did it or more, did you notice the changes in requests changed? Because, for example, yeah. I remember when I was younger, it was all just normal socks, and then uh, half socks started coming in, or mm-hmm. grip socks, and obviously the cutting of the socks started to happen. Um, did you know it? Did you notice a change in certain things? Through that? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Like, towards the start, it was very basic. And the boys thought yeah. it was more just get on with it. You know, just get to the ground, get changed, get on with it. Whereas towards the back, and it started becoming, you know, I need to wear these certain skins. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You know, even you get players that it's you know, 35 degrees in Perth, I'm wearing long skin compression. Yeah. Um, That's probably me at some point. You you, you like them. You like them. <laughs> see, I, see, <laughs> you well, I, well, Rash, let's see. What, okay. So, so, for example, you, right? Yeah. What was your, during your playing days, things you had to have game day? Probably long skins. Long, long skins. Upper skins. And you had the... um. The, the compression bottoms, right? Because yeah, you yeah, did your yeah. groin, he yeah? Remembers, yeah? It's like a, the cafe person that remembers your order. He's an almanac. 20 years later. Yeah. yeah. Mm. It's like 10 years ago, bro. Yeah, man. man. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you know just what? Just an oat latte. Just knowing Rash, <laughs> he'd surely be one of the easy ones. Yeah, yeah. Rash was one of the He's so ones. easy going. Yeah, and what about... No, I had the groin shorts because yeah, I had the, the OP. Did, yeah. Yeah. Couldn't play without them. And so they were the, the uni the armor. What were you saying? Under, Under armor ones. Under armor ones. Chafing. Um... Was and then there I wasn't, any, it wasn't too much. Was there man, any pre-game meal, drink? You know what? If I was no in snus. the Yerba Mate, that would be in my locker every mm, week every these days, but it's not there. It wasn't there at the time. Nah, nothing nothing too crazy. I don't think I was too crazy. No at Siggy that. at no. halftime. Nah, no Siggy. Guido, I think a lot of people want to know, and when I say that, I mean myself. How often do players in the A-League... Get a brand new kit 
or brand new shorts or whatever? Like, what's the turnover? Because as a youngster, I always thought, oh, they're pros. Every single game, they'll get fresh from the mega store or whatever, or wherever they get it from. Fresh kit, fresh shorts, fresh socks, and even new boots. But what's the turnover when it comes to match gear? Again, at the start, it was very... Like, it came from the top. You know, no one gives their shirt away. So everyone would get two home, two away. For the whole season? For the whole season. What? Yes. So uh, towards the back end, <coughs> we would go through shirts like crazy. Like, we were, we spent more time pressing shirts during the week than we did Are doing you pressing them? Yeah. So you're doing the names, numbers, yep. the badges? Um, the majority of that stuff comes already on the stuff. Yeah. We're putting on the the names and numbers on the back. So... But what, we, what? We, we would, for example, towards the back end of my time, we would go through maybe, we would lose between sort of 10 to 15 shirts every game. Oh, just far gone. Out. Boys giving them away, taking them. Hmm. Um, Gil, I want to ask, when that was happening, do you know if players had to pay for the shirt that they were giving away? Uh, towards the back end, we had to actually implement a system because yeah. we were just losing... Too many. Because I was at a club that had that. I was like, if you give your shirt away, it's Cause what would 30 like euros. A, what would a cost price be for a shirt? Oh, about maybe 60 bucks. That's cost. So yeah, 60 bro. bucks That's and a then... a lot every week. Yeah. You're like, I you're mean, looking... A, by the time you... What's that? I said, that's a lot for a week, but maybe that's not for yeah. a big club. But yeah. 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 Well, up. I, I know up. like a lot of the big clubs, even like the Real Madrid, they do the same thing. Yeah. Where you just get X amount of shirts. Yeah. You get X amount of shirts sort of up front. Yeah. And then for every one that you take or give away, then it just gets deducted from your pay. Yeah. Actually, just sidebar that. So, so right now, Victory get more than one. Sh- they're allowed to give it away. Yeah. So right. when when I left, we used to give the boys, I think, like a leeway of four shirts. Yep. Or two shirts, maybe. And then yep. after that, yeah, you'd get deducted pay. So in terms of this, has stressed me out, and I've never had to do it. The one thing I can't stop thinking of is an away trip. And forgetting something. Especially Wellington or something. My gut's turning already. <laughs> <laughs> Give us your best story. I feel like you're so good. You might not, you might only have like one or two, but like surely there was a time where you went on an away trip as a kit man and forgot something and wanted to just melt. Yeah, it happens to everybody. Yeah. It happens of course. to everybody. Um we had an away kit. Yep. That when Adidas released it, they had these, we used to call them poxy blue shorts, but they used to be like sky blue short. Yep. It was horrible. And with it, with there was so much backlash and because it looked like Sydney FC. Of course. So we sort of got together, had a meeting, and we said, we're not wearing them. Like, I'm not taking them to any trip. We need white, white, white shorts. Yep. So anyway, we got, we got the white shorts made up, sent in before the season started. And... um. We had this this thing that I used to call it the Bible, where you have every match that you play during the year and what kit you have to wear. Okay. And that gets confirmed sort of like on the Wednesday before a match. Yep. And uh, anyway, I get the the confirmation. Yeah. We're in white, white, white. Everything gets packed, and we we're about to board the plane. And Broxy, I was standing next to Trimmers. He was a footy ops manager. And Broxy says, "You know what? What, what kit are we wearing?" I said, "We're we're in all white." And Trimmers turns to me, he goes, yeah, you brought the blue shorts. And I go, yeah, yeah, yeah. And we laugh and we just get on the plane. We get to the morning after and we're sitting at the team meeting after the team walk. And he says, you know when you laughed yesterday about the blue shorts? He goes, you brought them, didn't you? And I said, no. <laughs> so there was a change in the kit from the Wednesday to the day that we travelled. And that didn't come down to me. Like an email. Yeah, so it did, I never got it. So we're literally ran out of the meeting, calling Mel and saying, someone needs to go to Amy Park, <laughs> grab the ridiculous blue shorts and bring them to Parramatta as soon as possible. So it was against Wanderers. Against Wanderers, yeah. So we... um, What was the time it, frame they had to pick up the shorts, get on a flight and get to Parramatta? Team meetings were always like 10 a.m., and I, the team would have arrived by six thirty. <laughs> so I, I, like we, <coughs> I got the bag about ten minutes before the bus arrived, 
and it was just like quick. So, just but landed. what's the consequence if they don't? If that if the shorts are not there and there's only white shorts, what's the consequence? I mean, you get potential? a fine. Oh, okay. okay, you okay. get a fine. Yeah. Okay, from the league. But does the does the home team then have to compensate because they're the ones that can, uh, I guess, have access to like their their different colors or whatever? Um, or is it complete? No, we're home. We're wearing this. Yeah. So you get you <clears throat> can get teams that would sort of pull that card. And they go, oh, bad luck. Deal with it. And nothing more I hate than a color clash. Worst thing in football. Oh like. my god, bro! I watched actually. It was Newcastle Tottenham maybe three weeks ago, four weeks ago. Mm-hmm. I couldn't even watch the game. Yep, it was annoying me so much. We we yep. had. I don't know if you were still with us. We played Wellington away. Yep. And they'd released a special kit. Uh, for a match against us And um, We get an email again from FA saying Look, they've released this new kit We've We don't know what it looks like Because they haven't sent us samples Well done, Can Nicks. you guys <laughs> take home and away kits So that we on game day the ref can make a decision So right. double the weight Pretty much, yeah This is I, this is whilst I've walked out of Amy Park That I've got this call yeah. oh. the, the day before <laughs> oh, we've be travelled Yeah <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, we get to the ground, the referees come in early, I've set up the change room, we brought both kids out, and they said, no, you got to wear your home kit. So I had to unpack the whole change room, change everything back out again. M- meanwhile, the, the decision has now been told to the clubs. Mm. Get a call from the club saying, don't change, because we had two different sponsors on Home and Away Kids. So anyway, long oh. story short, about 10 minutes before the game starts, we're forced to change another again. So the players and are already in their kit. So the players are in the kit warming up. We're doing shooting. There's 10 minutes till the game starts. <laughs> and I've had to run in and change all the kit again. We're in the tunnel and the boys have lined up and they look identical. Like I think <laughs> they were in like light grey, dark grey, and we were in white... And our dark blue shorts and socks. And uh, I'm standing there and I'm going, oh, what is this? Fahid turns around. And <laughs> of course he does. In typical you know, Fahid fashion. <laughs> what the hell are you doing? I go, man, I don't to know. You? Yeah, to me. <laughs> you start it out. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm sweating from changing. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, it's an absolute disaster. Throughout the whole game, my phone's blowing up. We get, we got... Touched up that game So we, we played we, the game We ended up We played yeah Hold on Your phone's we, getting blown up by who? We end up losing 2-0 On a pitch that was pretty much Spray painted on <laughs> So All of the boys' boots We've had to throw out The balls we had to throw out The kit we had to throw up And then I'm getting messages On my phone I'm getting calls Like on social media All this abuse Because I think I've forgotten the kit so it got to a point where I, yeah, I'm just going. Let me let me confirm this. I'm sorry to cut you off, bro. You were told by the club specifically you, they have to wear that kit because of the sponsor. It was a back and forth between FA, the club, the referees, and you've just taken the whole burden of everything. Regardless of what happened, it was going to clash because every everything was just put some fucking bibs on and let's play. <laughs> like, and what? yeah, it was a disaster. It was a disaster, and it had to. They had to release an article, like in the Herald Sun, pretty much stating everything of that happened. They did. Release an article that says something positive, you idiots. Like Keep if you on. if you look watch on YouTube, you can't tell the teams apart. So right, so this is for the clip, man. This is against this. Knicks, against Wellington no. in in no. Auckland, in Auckland. That's intense, man. It was yeah. So they're your two sort There's, of I want to just dissolve right yeah, here, right now moments. Yeah, oh yeah. Oh, yeah. What about ACL? Anything in the ACL? Because that's a bigger trip. That's, that's like, huge. That's huge. That's like they you were, go, you're going to Seoul, mate, <laughs> and you forget. Yeah. Thirty. Yeah. No. Nah, no. Nah, nothing. Nothing ever. I don't. <laughs> nothing. I don't think anything ever happened in the Champions League. Well, you are you I'm, very particular because are you, are you the type to d- triple check? Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Like you I just w- don't trust yourself sometimes to the point where I know I've done it, but I'm just going to check again. Yeah, I would. Like, I would have like my packing list and then. List to recheck what I packed. How long would it and take you to do a game day? Uh, set up? Yep. I would always aim to be there th- about maybe three hours before okay. the team arrived. 
Um, so you're doing everything, washing the kids. No, we, we, we had a laundryman. Oh, you had a laundryman. Okay. Yeah, okay. Gaz. Shout out Gaz. Shout, Big out, shout out to Gaz. Gaz. Man. You speak Gaz very highly the, of Gaz. He's, uh, he was the OG of that of that club. Uh, a bit, of the – no, he, he came in – Gaz came in 2010 maybe, 11. Did he? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, mate, maybe it was just his aura. Maybe, yeah. He just felt like, like he'd he was, around. Didn't he? He was felt like part of the <laughs> fabric. Like there was oh, yeah. like – and you, you have that – obviously that feeling as well was like – you go talking about how what Gav was saying about how it makes the club, and right. there is this thing. I think this kit man, how you said the fly on the wall. It's like you're the only person that interacts in the closed circles of the players, yep. the staff, the office, everyone, everyone. No one else crosses boundaries like that, yep. and you got to somehow manage that by because you were someone that would. I don't know if this is going to get you in trouble, but you would tell us a little bit of I was stuff that's say, going on. Yeah. So we're across it. Oh, okay, the, that's what's happening like with the coaches. That's hey, what's Rash, happening with the office. You're getting dropped this week. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but you did it really well in a way where it's like, you know, we felt like we could trust you yeah, and that you weren't going to go tell a rat on us or something, but that you somehow, yeah, you were able to float between them. Yeah, and is, that, I think that's hard. always like the hardest thing to do, right? Because you're getting... You know, you'd always get someone that, you know, would need, you know, like a counselling session. Like, mm-hmm. All right, let's go, let's go have a chat. Let's go have a coffee, sit down. So they're sort of telling you one thing and then you're getting the coaches going. Oh, he's like, oh, so you're you know, a therapist so as well. <laughs> there's been, ma- there's been many, yeah. many a counselling sessions in the kid room. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, man. Many. What about you though? I was thinking um, that's another thing. I feel like as a player, you would get certain players that would want to suck up to you for kids, for uniform, and then you'd get players that probably treat you not the best. Did you notice that you were warm, more warm to other players and then you could sort of slip a, slip, slip a few because you're like, yeah, the club's never going to find out about this jersey or this jacket. Oh, yeah, Bang. yeah, all, all the time. You know? like, I mean, yeah, like, you know, you hear some horror stories about other, you know, from other kit men in the league about certain plays, but I think I had it really easily, yeah. like really easy. I think victory... Really, they didn't just sign anybody. They signed players that would fit into the fabric of the club. Hold on. i got to push back. For pod's sake, devil's advocate. (laughs) Marquee signings, right? You're saying that out of the big ones, none of them gave you a hard time? From the outside looking in, it just looked like them being there was a hard time for the club. Um, Who are you talking about? I'm talking about Harry Kuehl, Nanny. Yo, oh, you were, you'd left. When no, they, no. I were, oh, you I were there. Okay, so Harry Kuehl, Nanny. Uh, who else was there? Marquee. Honda. They're the big ones I can think of right now. But then you've got like your Mills, Archie. Blah, they're all Marquee, but they're Aussie. So those three in particular, was there anything interesting with them? Because they didn't have the best time at the club, all three of them, mm. really. We struggled with Kuehl. Nanny barely played, and Honda was, let's just say, one of the most unique characters I think I've ever come across and would just say random. He's got one interview, bro. But anyway, tell us about the the, the press conference. Yeah, the press conference. (laughs) (laughs) And then he just randomly went to coach Cambodia. Like, (laughs) I don't know. That's true. Yeah, like, what? Like, (laughs) what? He came from, did he come from Milan? He came from Milan, wasn't it? I think so. He like, what? What a played a World Cup and then he signs for Melbourne Victory. Is that what happened? Him and Ola Toivonen. Oh, like oh yeah, Ola played like six yeah, games yeah. at the World Cup and then he's going on training camp to the Sunshine Coast. Yeah, what the <laughs> Do you have any stories about these, Mark? I loved Ola Toivonen, by the way. But he was unbelievable. Um, he was unbelievable. So good. Unbelievable. Do you have any stories about like other marquee players different? You said before that the guys that have been at the top maybe were easier to deal with. Was there anything in particular that any of those four asked for or you thought, oh, these guys are different? Is there any stories, anything like that? Um, I mean, they all had their little things, but they weren't really anything that you would go, oh. We had we had one player, and I won't name him because yeah. I want to yeah. embarrass him, but he wanted his shirts custom-made. 
to his body profile. <laughs> and he wasn't he wasn't that Ripped. big of a player. <laughs> okay. Oh, and, he, okay. and he goes, hey, look, can, can we call editors and see if we can... I said, look, let me handle it. He goes, no, no, let's call him now. So I've put the guy from editors on the phone. He's, so he's on loudspeaker. And he picks up and he goes, look, it's me here with... He wants... His, if his shirt can be custom made like the Real Madrid players. Beep. He hanged up. Really? He hanged up. It was Sook some kit. That's who it yeah. was. Um, that's Just crazy. Take it to Dandenong. That's, that's Get it so... Get 20 bucks. Like, what? <laughs> that's so odd. Um, back to those marquee players. And look, you know, I'm not just going to put them in a box and say that just because you're a marquee player that you're an asshole. Because you can, like you said, you can get players that are not that big and request wild stuff or whatever. Were there any players you don't have to name that gave you a hard time? Like, not even what they were asking for, but like, oh, it's just a kit, man. Like, you know. No one that would treat you like that. Like okay. To, to, you know, like so that. everyone was respectful. Everyone was respectful, yeah. But you all, you always have players, like, you know, that, you know, they, they get frustrated that they don't perform. I used to have a player that if he didn't play well, he would always get angry at something. <laughs> and it could be something that's completely, you know, my socks were too tight. Oh, yeah, right. <laughs> or wasn't you know, him. The it was strapping not him. was or, or this or that. And then like he would always get angry and we'd have we had lots of arguments. Lots of arguments. So and you one on one with the player? Yeah. Yeah. Because you, you sort of reach a point where you just go, oh, enough, man. So I'm what are you good. turning around and saying, like, oh fuck off, mate? Like what, what, like No, not not in a nicer way. And then if it escalates, you sort of but I got, like, a lot of the boys would sort of then chip in and sort of help you out. I think that's yeah. normally what would happen, right? Like, especially yeah. if it happens around other people. Yeah, like other for, for was like, was one of them. That yeah, would always, Fahid. that would always. Yeah. But then he would always sort of, you know, have a crack. And yeah, then, he would, he wouldn't have been the nicest as well, hmm. surely. No, nah, he was fine. He was, surely he, he, was, he, was, he was fine. He was fine. He never had. <laughs> he the, seemed he like would, the type to go. Guido, my fucking sock's still tight. And then Rash goes, yeah, mine are tight too. And he goes, don't fucking talk to Guido like that. <laughs> <laughs> like, that's what he sings like. No, I reckon, if I, if I, I don't think I never had any issues with Fahid. He would say stuff, but yeah. I, I never. Yeah. Guido, can yeah. I ask you, what was, the, what was it like post-game in terms of, obviously, the change rooms, everything's everywhere. Were you the one that had to clean up everything or was there a lot of boys that would give you a hand afterwards? Because, like, for from my sake, oh, right. I'm always one of the last ones out. So I always notice that, like, I'll help out a bit just to clean up because sometimes there's just a mess everywhere, you know? Um, does that – does do the players give you a hand or is there some sort of responsibility like, oh, yeah, that's your job? No, nah, bo- boys were great. Boys yeah. were great. I think like Rash said, you know, a lot of the boys, you know, we – there was there was always stuff that would come from the captains or the coaches yeah. where everyone helped out with a bag at the airport. Yeah. Everyone would it didn't matter where you were on the if you were a captain, yeah, marquee, just pick up a bag at the airport and put it. Yeah. And it, after games as well, you'd always get sort of the younger boys because I, I would spend the majority of I guess the second half packing up so that we can get out as quick as possible. Yeah. So a lot of the young boys would sort of. So the second take half, a you wouldn't be watching the game. Uh, it, TV, maybe. It'd be yeah. The majority of really? the time, I'd, I'd watch it on TV. Oh, yeah. right. Fuck, yeah. I didn't even know that, bro. Yeah. yeah, yeah. It changed a little bit, sort of, when Kev took over. He was he placed a lot more responsibility on everybody. Yeah. So there was a bit more stuff that I had to do on the bench. So it changed a little then. Yeah. But once Kev left, yeah. it was more sort of just working out of the changes. That's that's a good segue. Let's talk coaches. Yeah. From my understanding and mathematics, you would have worked under Mehmet? Ernie. Sorry, Ernie, then Mehmet, then was it Jim Majilton? Yes. Then Muskie? No, sorry, Ange, Ange wasn't Ange. it? Ange, Muskie, and then who was your last coach? Muskie. No, Marco Kurtz. Marco Kurtz. from Curve, Kev. Yep. 
Marco left. Carlos Salvatore was left in charge for a bit. Yep. Then Brebs came in. Brebs, yeah, I told you there's tons, bro. I forgot, bro. He asked me which coaches, and I said, I think I said like three. You said three. You said Musky, Ange, and Aaron Ernie. <laughs> and I said, Nah, we've had some times. Fucking hell. So we're not obviously we don't have time to go into all of them, but are there anything? What are the major differences of working under such different managers? Because they're from different parts of the world. They've got different pedigrees. Some did amazingly. Some should never coach again. <laughs> what were the differences, the major differences? Like, is there stuff that sticks out to you? Like you said, Musky placed more um, responsibility on mm. you. Um, yeah, they were the better ones were very clear with what they wanted. Yep. Just as clear as they were on the pitch with the players, they were as clear with the staff. Yep. So they sort of uh, sort of set their standard and this is sort of this is what we work from. And then you then take that and base your decisions and what you would do, what you would say, how you would act based on what sort of that coach wants. What what are some of the the demands that the better coaches are asking of you compared to the ones that weren't? Um, like, what are the little details, the one percenters? Oof. It's it's hard to maybe put your finger on something. Yeah. But, you know, the standards that are set in terms of, you know, where the level you have to work at and what you have to produce, you know, something like, for example, we had a coach who would – would not allow staff to have pockets because he didn't want anyone being around the training pitch with hands in their pockets because he thought he was a bad look. So everyone, the coaches, oh, yeah. could not have po- ha- pockets on their in their gear. So, but hold on. So um, then, how do you, how do you get gear like that? So you the only things you order, you, or you, you're getting you, no, you order it. You just, you just order it like that from the supplier. Just gonna have to shove your phone and your keys up your ass. Oh, yeah. Well, that's a, yeah. It's a, others would have no phones. Um, oh yeah, there's. Just, I think that's a good just one. So many. I know. I know who that would have been. Man. There's one that sticks out to me that I feel like would have. Anyway, would have said that. Yeah, well, did, did I'm not gonna put him on you know the spot, but like, did you have it? We'll speak. Were, were, I'm assuming there's a hierarchy somewhere of like which that you felt more intimidated by and the ones that you felt. More relaxed around. Um, were you were, were some of them that you felt like they walk in the room you feel scared around them? Not scared, intimidated. I think Ange at the start because <laughs> I was I was young. I was eighteen, mm. um, and I didn't have a job when he first sort of came in. So everyone that I'd sort of worked under beforehand, I'd been around or they knew me. So obviously Ernie opened the doors. Mehmet knew me because he was around the club. Um, so Ange was sort of the first one that I had no relationship with. But that changed very quickly. So you were tight with Ange? I wouldn't say I'm, t- I'm tight with him, but... He was at, the very time, different. at the time? He was very different with the staff than he was with the players. He I remember di- you he saying a, this He was a different me. person. I remember you saying this to me. A lot sort of... With, with the staff, he was... A, oh, sorry, with the players, he was the boss. Yep. Like standoffish... Um, you know, I, no relationship with the players other than said you're coaching week. them. Yep. Whereas with the staff, he was, you know, some of like my best times at the club were after dinners at hotels or lunches because you would sort of like just sit back and just listen to these guys talk, you know, and oh, wow. on, on, in every aspect, football-wise, stories, um, yeah, they they just. They just Stand out. So would you say that out of all the managers you worked under, and this is not <clears throat> a diss at any of the ones that you don't mention, but who was your favourite to work under? Or who did you feel like you were at your peak with? Kev. <clears throat> Kev. Um, I'd, I'd known Kev since I was 12. Um, when obviously he was at the club. He was playing. and He was playing. Yeah. He sort of, by the time he took over, he knew my entire family. Um, really? Yeah. 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 Um, so you said there Kev was, was amazing as well. I don't think he gets. Yeah, I think he's underrated. Nah, I think <laughs> yeah. I think one of the biggest misconceptions of Kev is obviously his reputation as a player precedes. Yep. Yeah. You know, it's not who he is. You know the way he's 
treated his staff, you know, the plays. He was very, very good at that. I would have guessed, Kev, because of what for, from what you said. And if you've known someone since 12, you're going to look out for them. Mm. If you know their family and all that. And that must feel really comforting knowing that this guy's the boss, but he's also got my back. Um, are there any stories that really, like, if someone says to you, or if someone says to you, what are you doing? You say, I'm a kit man. What's the first or the best story that comes to mind of your journey at the club? There's got to be one. Whether it's funny, whether it's sad, what's the best thing you think you've witnessed? Man, there's just so many. Because, um, you know, when I started supporting the club to when I got the job, it's all I wanted to do. Yeah. So I followed Melbourne Victory. I supported Melbourne Victory. I love Melbourne Victory. So getting the job was the ultimate goal. Yeah. It was, it was a dream almost. Um, you know, when I started the job, I set myself and I said, doesn't matter how long this journey goes for, how long it is, if it lasts one year, if it lasts 20, 30, 40, I want to be able to win win the league with this club yep. and travel. Yep. And, you know, 2015 was such a special year um, in every aspect. Everything was just that whole year, and even a couple of the years that followed after, just encapsulates. You know, if if I only worked for those three years, I'm happy because we managed to tick so many boxes. Rash, you were saying to me yesterday that that was, or well, that would be yeah. his favorite. Yeah. Well, through that, period, did you win anything with Merrick? Uh, it was the first time you won something? Pro- uh, officially, yeah. Um, oh, as w- while you're working, at whilst the club. I was working, yeah, yeah. Okay. that yeah. was like yeah. the first. And, it, and and the other thing of like, again, we spoke about it last time with Fahid was like that group, just the group of people, the coaching staff. You had Ant, you had JP, you had Muskie, you have all the type, the different personalities in the change rooms. You have the chairman, you have all the office staff, like that. Um, that whole place at that time, especially that year when we won, it was amazing, huh? And I think, I remember you actually on the ground after. I don't know if there's anyone that cares more about Melbourne Victory than than you, huh? Like, yeah, that it year, was, man. That yeah, it was. It was. It was always. It was more than just a job. Yeah, mm. you know, it was way more than that. It took for me. pride in it. Yeah, yeah, right. yeah, um, yeah. But that that year was so special, you know, like the staff. You know, we st- all of us were still keeping touch all the time. Mm. That you know, I got married last year, and they were all, they were all there. They were all, you know, relationships that you know, which is very rare in football yep. to keep relationships. You know, Guido, you know can I ask? Sorry, it just reminds me of something that Muskie said before, before one of the games leading into that. I remember he said something like, "Doesn't matter whether you, whether you're best mates here in this room at the moment." If you win something together, I guarantee you in 30 years, 40 years, if you walk past each other, you'll you'll still share something together and you'll have like this loving connection with this person. Regardless whether you're the best mates and you go to coffee or whatever, it's like if you win something together, you'll see how special that is for your, that relationship for the rest of your life. It's true, huh? It's so true. Mm, like yeah. we, you know, we, especially amongst the staff, the group that we had, you know, you had a, a, the sort of heads of every department, the assistant coaches, S&C, They'd known each other for a long time and they'd worked with each other. They had a close relationship. But then you had sort of layer underneath, which were all of us young guys, mm. that we'd all somehow supported the club. We all did the hard yards together, working in the youth team, getting a job with the first team. And we all wanted to match them. So that really brought everyone together. We we're all on the same page. And like you say, Rash, you know, you. We, it's been sort of 10 years and yeah. you sit down after a coffee and the first thing that comes to mind is, is the final. Yeah, yeah, and then, yeah. like, you know, I think we spoke about it where you sort of, someone says something and then, oh, you remember that? And then, oh, yeah, but you remember that? And mm. he did that. Yeah. And, yeah. and it's just, and you just, we were just in, in camp with the under-17s in Italy and Anth was in camp with us. Yeah, right. And 
we would just sit down and just tell stories all day. Yeah. And like it was sort of like we were holding court and you know, everyone would sort of sit around and we'd go, <laughs> you know, when we did mm. this to that guy and we, when he did that and and there's yeah. such treasured memories. Yeah. What was it like when the club was doing horrible? Sorry to change the mood, but I just, I just want to. <laughs> That's. Uh, I just want. I just want to know because everything's all flowers and roses, and it's all jolly yeah. when everyone's having the best mm. time of their life. And Fahid and Rash are best buddies. But what's it like? What's the mood like? What's the workload like when it's not going well? Because Victory are the best and the biggest club in the A League. There's no doubt about it. But there's been some years, especially when that that block where you were there. Where it was bad. How different is it? Or is there some, an example you can give me of the mood changes or whatever when, when it's not going well? It's, it's night and day. Night and day. Night and day. Um, it's difficult. It's difficult. I think it's harder going from being successful to not doing well. Yes. Than doing well to then being successful. Because the expectations are sort of still there. Um but it was horrible, man. Honestly, we went through some some hard times. Was there a specific time. moment where you thought, oh boy, we're going to have to push through this one? Like, is there a specific season? I know you don't want to dig out coaches and players and stuff, but it, it's public at the end of the day in terms of when victory were doing good or when they weren't. But was there a specific moment or, you know, an epiphany or something even where you just thought, okay, we're in it now. We've got to group together and we got to, we got to get out of this. Yeah, there was significant moments in the change rooms or, or I guess standards that perhaps dropped. Yep. So there were, there were Kev and, you know, the, and, and Ange, you know, they had certain standards of how, what players should be like, how they should behave. And that translated down, you know, just even simple stuff like leaving stuff, your boots in front of your locker. Mm. You know, that always, remember, you couldn't leave stuff on the floor in the change room. That's yep. true. Yeah, and... And, you know, you sort of walk in and that's all of a sudden gone. Those sort of little standards. And they're the ones that you pick out and you go, okay, that's not right. And then they start translating. So it festers. Yeah. It starts off with one thing and then it starts growing. So that was one of the moments, like little things like that. Like yeah. Seeing where the you boots. Notice, yeah. Even something like, like the cleanliness of lockers. You know, before you get fined if you had to mess your locker. Where then that sort of thing changes. So, that's interesting, yeah, because it would, it would trickle down slowly, slowly if little things, the one percenters are adding up. Um, what about in terms of joking around, the mood, maybe what the coaches let slide or the players let slide? Was it super strict when, you, when the form was bad? Or was it just like, this is the standard no matter whether we're on top or on the bottom? Um... You know what I'm saying, right? Like, yeah, 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 yeah. The players are going to joke, yeah. oh, we're top of the league, cool, let's joke around, let's pinch each other's ass at training. But you're not doing that if you last. No, I th and I think, you know, when we were doing the best and going, if you lost, it was, there was like an, an inquest into what happened. Yeah. And it was never, ever taken lightly. Mm. Um, you know, even st something like, you wouldn't get called up on it, but if you smiled or laughed after a loss or maybe in the day after the game or two days after, you'd see sort of, what's going on? What? You know what I mean? <laughs> um, we were speaking yeah. about performative anger where it's like maybe even if you're not that angry, you better not show you're happy mm. because yeah. it's a bad look. It's just a bad look. I'm a Chelsea fan. I relate everything back to Chelsea. I always say on Twitter, when we weren't doing so well, we're cooking now, when we weren't doing so well, Stop taking play. Stop taking photos of the players laughing at training. I don't care that you score top bins at training. Cool fucking highlight reel. Do it on the weekend. They're the things. Yeah, if I hit, I was. I, I always used to. I when around that time, I you know I was. I struggled to contain emotions. Yeah. Especially, you know, you're playing in front of forty thousand at Derby and you lose. You know. And Fahid would always call me out, call me out on it. He goes, "Why, why are you angry? Because you're not playing." I said, "Yeah, but now I got to deal with, <laughs> I got to deal now with all the consequences, all the boys being angry, or the coaches being angry. You know, sometimes you lose one or two games, and then all of a sudden you start changing stuff." That's what I wanted to ask you, Guido. Is what is your 
everything's set up. Boys are about to go out. How are you in the change rooms? Obviously, you're there with the boys. They're all, you know, getting G'd up. And I feel I've had different types of kit men's that act certain ways depending on, you know, just before game day. Um, how are you in the change rooms just before they, they walk out? Are you G'ing the boys up? Are you getting around them? Are you more in your corner, quiet? Yeah, um, no, I mean, I, I always try to stay out of the way. Yeah. You know, I think that's, you know, it's not my real place, you know, to be... You know, slapping boys on the ass and, yeah. and yeah. giving them hey, instructions. You, you run the cha- Archie, run the channels. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> which I feel like I've had different experiences with kitmen. You know, There's really, they, they're giving you instructions, not instructions, mm. but you know, they're getting the boys up. They're, mm. you know, come on, mm. boys, let's go. Um, especially kitmen that have been there a bit longer, mm. or some are really in their shell. You know, yeah. And I feel like kitmen's are very, what's the word? Specific people. They're very unique, you mm. know. I've had all types of kitmen. Meticulous. Um, so they've all had their own ways inside the change room. And I think that's why I wanted to ask you, what were you like around the boys? And then obviously it could be different if there's a draw, if there's a loss, if there's a win, you know. If there's a win, are you all about the boys? Yeah, getting, yeah. You know, getting the cans out, having a drink <laughs> or, you know. Yeah, yeah, I mean, I always sort of tried to be – I always like to get in really early. Yeah. So that for me, if I didn't do anything in the nine from the in the ninety minutes that from the time that the boys arrive till they go out on the pitch, if I don't do anything, that to me is a sign that I've done my job right. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So I've always tried to be sort of very calm and if someone asks something or you know, calm, yep, no problems. And then I'd go in the kit room and then either panic if I didn't have it or sort of then do whatever needed to be done. Yeah, yeah I could um, never be a kit man. I think from my side, I remember you being pre- like pretty chill and just being yeah. like a support coming around. Yep, good luck. Yeah, like, yeah, yeah. Just sort of so you like, you know, there's little things, again, the players would like. Or, you know, for example, like Lawrence, Laws always liked for me to take his bottle to the goal and would have like a little hug. There were yeah. little things like that that some players like to do, but and then yeah, if we won, then after the know. game, I remember I remember a particular game where we, I think it was, <laughs> it was China, I think it was in China. It was an ACL somewhere. Do you remember this? Where we were sneaking around the hotel after, sneaking into each other, into each other's rooms, Just getting piss fighting around, getting beer. We went down to the local shop, got a few beers. Everyone got maybe two each, and then we're <laughs> sneaking through the hallway, going yeah, into in someone's China. room. In China, was it yeah. China? Yeah. And I'm sitting there. Someone I'm was s- in a bath at one point. Yeah, with a beer. Because my my, <laughs> I remember the rooms were huge, and like I had like a spa or something in my room. <laughs> That's right. Yeah, and there used to be like this big living room. I had like a living room in my you said in you my own room. Ruffle yeah, in China. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and and um. I remember the boys sneaking in and they're all having a laugh, having fun, you know. And I'm thinking, if the boss walks in, <laughs> I'm done. But is it your yeah. place? Like, I feel like you'd be on the fence like, oh, it's not my place to say something, but I better just in case we all don't get in trouble. <laughs> yeah, well, it's impossible with these boys. Because it's also when coming you, back at you also. They're yeah, going to get angry at you. Yeah, like, they're also going to get angry at us, but also at you. <laughs> yeah. A hundred percent, yeah. What was the yeah. story, the Tasmania one? <laughs> Oh man! Um, Come on, give us a stories, Guido. Just leave a name out. So, <laughs> so I was, I was first. We used to do this a training camp in Tasmania every year. It'd be like seven days, like the longest seven days. Of it. In and um, <laughs> and um, anyway, we finished. We finished the camp, and the boys sort of wanted to go out. So the, the boss says, "No problems, go out." But it was like a curfew, like 11 o'clock. Andrew or Muskie? Andrew. And he says to me, go, just make sure that, you know, they're all back by the curfew. No problems, boss. Anyway, get get to the, went out to dinner with the staff and then I joined the boys at the bar and I don't know if it was Hobart or Launceston. And uh, I'm looking at my watch, a couple of the boys start dispersing get them into cabs and there's like a group of four or five of them that are not having any of it. I'm going, come on boys, let's go because, you know, the boss said, nah, don't worry about it, it'll be fine, he won't know. Come on boys, let's go, let's go. It's like 11 o'clock, 12 o'clock, 1 o'clock. 
And I'm trying to push them in. I'm like, come on, boys, we have to go. Anyway, out of the corner of my eye, we're sitting outside and I see the CEO, <laughs> the promoter, the guy that brought us, that took us there and a couple of other politicians. Or so I go, boys, inside. Get them all, throw them into the bar, push them to the very back. <laughs> hey, enough. I keep my eye out. They walk past. So I said, you know, all right, we're going to go home. I turn around and one of the boys on the bar, standing on the bar, holding court with everyone in there, dancing, yelling, everyone's got the phone out. <laughs> you know I'm making you tell me who that is later, right? We'll go. We'll go. Yeah. <laughs> You'll guess it. Okay. <laughs> I yank him down, start getting them all into cabs. Anyway, it's like three o'clock in the morning by now. <laughs> I'm on in a the pre-season cab. camp. Yeah, I'm in, the ca- I'm in the cab and I'm thinking the boss is going to be sitting in the lobby waiting. <laughs> yeah. I fucking told you, mate. Yeah. Yeah. We get, anyway, thankfully, I make the cab driver drive past the front of the hotel, <laughs> do, a do a U-turn and come back to make sure that no one was watching and then I had to sort of tuck a couple of them into bed and, and hope that they... That they came, up they wake up for breakfast. And funnily enough, the morning after, like the bus, the bus left at like eight o'clock in the morning, and it's seven thirty, and two of the boys went down. Seven forty-five, seven seven fifty-nine. The hotel, the the elevator doors open, and they come out, <laughs> and I'm sitting on the bus, just like sweating, sweating. Because that was massive, bro. If you didn't get to the bus you had on to time, be, you could do, you could bro. do anything, but. Not be late to the bus. If you did, it if was, you walked in that bus after the time you were supposed to be there, it was like yeah, you'd killed someone. Ange knows everything, so he definitely would have found out. So what were the repercussions? If nothing happened. Ooh. Nothing happened. So I'm guessing, I'm hoping. I'm hoping. Maybe Ange was having a bit of fun himself. <laughs> maybe, <laughs> maybe he had a conversation in his office with him. Said, yeah. Come on, mate. Mate, these standards we set. He's... <laughs> I've, over the past 48 hours, I've seen what Tottenham's How made of. How good is his <laughs> interviews, man? They're the best. Can I actually ask you, bro? Because when I got there, it was just stock standard. Everyone called him boss. Where, oh. where did that come from? Was that... I don't know. I think it was it, just a... He's not even Italian. Is that is that a thing across all clubs? That's no, not here. Yeah. Gaffer. Right. I, I think it is nah, now. Gaffer's not here. I think it is now. Is it now? Yeah. Like now you sort of get told you just refer to him as boss. Because that was the... I think that was my first experience with using that. Boss, boss. I I know that I know all the the big time prem players. They they say boss and like you know. Oh like, yeah. Oh, bro. Some even say dad. But isn't it weird that then you even years and years later, I feel like mm. even if I saw Ange now or Musky, I would say mm. boss. Of course, bro. <laughs> isn't that weird, bro? It is weird, but that's just what it is. Like I told you the other day when Mourinho FaceTime John Terry. And he started cleaning up his house. And the wife's like, what are you doing? He's like, the boss is calling. Like, of course, I got all good. <laughs> but it's, it's when, so weird, when you, I guess when someone believes in you like that or they put their trust in you, just a certain level of, of respect, I guess, that just, it's like gross. you said, it just sticks with you. It's like Sir Alex. Yeah. Well, he's yeah, a knight. He's, a, he's knighthooded, but. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Like, you wouldn't be, hey, Alex, how's it going? Yeah, they're not going to say, <laughs> hey, Al. Like, Big yeah, Big Al, Fergo. <laughs> like, even David Moyes got angry when someone called him Moisey. And like, he's like, you're not my mate. Well, I don't know but what that's, you, hey, how you funny is that, Moise? right? So last year in the change rooms, one of the young boys comes in <coughs> and he said to the coach, how's it going, bro? Oh, right? No way. And the coach goes, I'm not your bro. You know, at NPL level, which is... Yeah, wow, well, yeah. The I youngsters be... don't understand the respect for the coach. <laughs> yeah. We we yeah. had a we had a an actually an intern that we brought in once and um Oh man, he was nasty. He walked in like maybe it was his second or third day into the office and he walks past the boss's office and he's got like a plastic container having lunch and he walks past his office and he goes, Hey champ, how you doing? No way. Who was the boss? Uh, I'm not gonna say, because it didn't it didn't end well. <laughs> like it was literally like everybody. We were all sort of like in the football department pod, and it happened. And you know those moments like in movies where everyone just stands up and looks, 
and everyone comes out of cubicles in their office and they look at and it was just dead silence and I'm going to make a guess. I'm going to say if it was Ange, he'd probably not address it much and just be like, get rid of that person. I'm guessing. And Muskie would absolutely blast him. That's my, that's my guess. Are we there, was, there, was, there was no reaction from the boss. Ooh. It was a... It was a behind the scenes. Hey, hey, mate. And... <laughs> oh, maybe it was Ange. And ma- oh, maybe not. Uh, Hold on. And then, and then he... The, the, straight the, the firing inter- Was it a straight firing? Oh yeah It was back to the back Listen You can't talk like that That same day <clears throat> Maybe yeah Yeah And there was like He had already had a couple of The fact that He had got, a, he had Like he had a yellow card already Oh he's just like strikes. a second yellow yeah. If you've got champ In your locker It's never good It's champ. never good I'm sorry it's No no idiot. If it's you fi- ever it's use champ ever No no and no, you're no, no. Not I disagree. Sir Alex You're an idiot I disagree Champ's good in your locker When you want to be a smart ass To someone who yeah, deserves yes. it Not yeah. fucking But down. that's what I mean I mean as a piss take Fair enough Yeah But, but if you're but seriously Called no someone way. champ No Champ or legend I think legend. it's Legend yeah, I think of both in the oh. Even she thinks so <laughs> So like he, he, he definitely came from Cedar. They're the Cedar standards. <laughs> yeah. They're the Cedar That's standards. Cedar. I went to Cedar, I know. Oh, Listen, mate, I know Cedar. he came from Cedar. If he's eating his lunch in a little container, go, hey, champ, <laughs> we just lost 3-0 in a derby or whatever. Hey, champ, there you go. You want to try my pasta? <laughs> mate, I would have killed him on the spot. <laughs> and then you've got people like you as like, so how, we, we, we've spoke about this before. And, you know, a lot of pros speak about it. How important was it? To address everyone, to be nice to everyone, no matter their hierarchy. Was that instilled from you from day one? Like, I don't care if they're the kit man. I don't care if they're the membership lady. I don't care if it's someone from Leonica. You treat them the same, everyone. Yeah, like day one. It was, it was just, it, was, it didn't have to be told. Yeah, it was just known. It was just part of like, the fabric of Melbourne victory. Yeah. What we were. Like Ange, for example... It was every morning, doesn't matter who's in the office, you shake their hand. And it doesn't matter what you're doing, if you're in a rush, if you, you shake everybody's hand. You walk into the change room, you shake hands. You, like there was once where we got a delivery from Nike and of boots, so it was like boxes and boxes and boxes. And um, I've gone in, I've picked them up, I've managed to sort of like... Yeah, stack you know, Like three boxes, like three <laughs> boxes on top. I can't even see where I'm going. And I walk past his office and I go, morning, boss. Morning, morning, Queens. I said, look, let me just put the boxes and I'll come shake your hand. He goes, no. He goes, put the boxes down. He goes, put the goddamn boxes down and shake my hand. I just shit myself. I just <laughs> dropped the, the boxes. He's an boss. Yeah, he's an He so goes, Greek. never, ever walk That's past so somebody without shaking their hand again. Like, Sorry, boss. I won't do it again. Mm. And like, what about... And what, about what the fuck? <laughs> <laughs> Come on, Edge. He said he was coming back. <laughs> like, he knew. Like, Edge, bro. Like, oh, sorry. <laughs> Boss. <laughs> it's all right. He'll never come on this podcast. But it's... You know what? And, and I think what he's alluding to in that interview that he's just done recently, it's very interesting, right? You have... If you're someone that... If you have winning standards, which he obviously mm-hmm. does, where he's... All of his success. Not a ton. He's gone. Hold on. Yeah. He's gone. This is what I think he's alluding to. Even though, for example, Australia, in the A League, is nowhere near the level of the English Premier League, obviously, right? He was at Melbourne Victory where the expectation is you win everything. You win, yeah. So everything is about the top standards of winning and being the best. Then you go to a club like Tottenham, even though they're 10 times way better than Melbourne Victory, they're in a place where they're not the winners, mm-hmm. the biggest team, the biggest club. They're not that. So then he, it's a different mindset where potentially they have situations where they lose things and people two days later are laughing. Mm-hmm. Whereas at Melbourne Victory, that wouldn't happen. Even, even in the years when they didn't do well, I almost guarantee that people weren't laughing two days after a loss. Even if you're... Cause just because it's victory, right? Just because like where the expectation is we win. Well, yeah. That, I mean, someone even made a compilation of three managers in a row saying the exact same thing. That 
there was just something off at, at Tottenham. Tottenham. Yeah, so Conti said it. He was Conti's Conti's one was the best. Right? His was the best. The rant. Mourinho said if there's one club I don't have an affection for that I've coached, it's Tottenham. Yeah, right. Wow. And and just come out and look, I'm gonna be real. This is off topic, just quickly. If I'm a Spurs fan, I don't want Arsenal to win the league. I don't give a fuck if we lose to City. I don't care. People can Ange can Ange is not going to come out in the media and say, "Oh, if some of our fans want us to lose, it's all right." Obviously, he's not going to say that. But there's a part of him that would understand. No, nah, I don't think so. No, I don't think. I, so. I, 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 I disagree. I think if if you have um, the mindset of someone that's a winner, I don't think you start to care about. I don't think you care more about r- rivalries than winning. I'm not I saying that. I don't. I'm not saying that. I know how Ange is. I'm saying he understands the rivalry because if he doesn't, then there's something wrong. I don't think he understands. Well, I don't think you would. Un- I don't think you would understand that. I, 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 maybe understand is the wrong word. Maybe he's aware. But what I'm trying to say is that Ange would not come out blatantly. Any manager wouldn't come out blatantly and say. You know, of course they're going to say we're going to try to win every game. You get fired on the spot, but I don't know. He he, he seems like he's genuinely distraught at this. Yeah, point. I, don't, I don't think. I don't he think would, it's yeah, performative. Don't, whatever it is, whatever whatever he whatever he thinks, I'm not like it. Obviously, it's not going to be super performative. But all I'm saying is, he. I don't care how high his standards are. I'm sorry, I'm having a crack here. He and the rest of the football world have to understand that they fucking hate each other. They do not care. I'm telling you right now, every Spurs fan I saw on Twitter did not want to win that game. They did not want to win that game. How's son misses a one-on-one, usually buries him, and then after the game he's laughing with Pep? I'm not fucking thick. I'm telling you, bro. Sometimes that situation with Ange, I get it. Um, There's nothing wrong with what Ange did, but he's cracked it now because of what's happened. And just cracked it because people at the club and the fans have the mentality that I'm talking about. That's, that's what I'm saying. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Yeah. That's what I'm saying. <laughs> maybe that's what I'm... Maybe... <laughs> all I'm saying is I fucking hate... All I'm saying is I hate Tottenham. And it's a shame that Ange is Bro, there. Bro, hold on. Sorry. Can we just segue off the, all the, the kit man stuff? If you, who do you hate as a club, Chelsea? Or but you the most? Arsenal. But the most? Arsenal. Okay. So you, let's say Chelsea have a game yep. to win or lose, and that's going to affect Arsenal's result of winning the league. You want to lose as a Chelsea fan. Caveat. What the fuck are Spurs playing for? Aston Villa got Champions League. I've, okay, maybe it's, maybe it's the difference between a fan mindset and someone that's doing the... Trying to achieve the thing. Maybe I disagree with myself and agree with you. I don't know what I'm saying right now. All I'm <laughs> all I'm saying is all I'm saying is that. Sorry, bro. <coughs> into the mic. All I'm saying is that he lost. I think this was Ange's realization of oh, I'm at Tottenham. Yeah, that's what I'm. So we're saying, are we saying the same thing and arguing? We are. Is that like, what's happening? We are. But I, what what you guys argue with is when I said. Surely Ange knows that uh, yeah, okay. the rivalry and, and like Ange came out, it was almost like he was surprised that fans and people that are part of the club were like, didn't want to win. It was almost like a shock to him. Like it right. shouldn't be a shock to him. Of course he wants his players to win and he's going to come out and say that. Of course. But that, maybe, okay. saying. maybe it's like, maybe it's also a shock, but it's also like, it just pisses him off. Of course, so it pisses him may, off. Yeah, yeah, okay. Maybe he understands it. Yeah, he know, he, know, he knows. Yeah, that it pisses him off. Yeah, because did you? Did, so there's a video of a Spurs fan in the crowd. Yeah, what did he say? He, look, you can't hear him, but someone's they've come out and said that basically it sounds like the Spurs fans saying, "Drop the game." <laughs> Like, drop the game. Like, fuck this shit. Oh my god! And, he, and Ange was hearing it all game, and then he turns around and goes. No, I just need a no for later. So if it's, it's you, yep, you're saying it? Cool. All right, cool. Can, can I ask you, as a Melbourne Victory fan, if w- would you, if Sydney FC are potentially going to win the league, would you want to lose a game so that then they, they don't win it? 
No, nah, but who do you hate the most, Quito? What club yeah. do you? What club do you? Racing. You, you've you've <laughs> been there. You've been there for ten years. And we, there's the original rivalry. Mm. There's the big blue, and there's the derby. Which one were you in the change rooms? Like, if we lose today, I'm gonna fucking. Um. Or was it oh, fucking geez. Central Coast or some shit? <laughs> <laughs> um. Jeez, I, I don't know. It's a tough one. I think Sydney, we played the most important matches. Yep. So yeah, like fair. The, That's true. Like there yep. was a time frame where every game against Sydney was for something or mattered. It was a premier's plate raise. It was a grand final. I think Adelaide was a little bit of a, they hate more than we hate them. That's, that's got to be a bullshit rivalry. Well, no, like no, I know Muskie's. We had two finals you know, grab with them, bro. His, grab, what's his name? Cosmina. Cos- Cosmina. Were you there throat? for that? Uh, no. Oh. no. And they try to market that, but come on. Nah, bro. We had two grand finals against them. But they're shit. Yeah, piss ant. But it's, it's Adelaide. No, nah, I'm joking, Adelaide. You're no, no, no. You're you not can shit. say it. You no, I'm not. Bro, you're a victory I'm player. Not They're not We're shit. not going to do anything with them. Don't <laughs> worry. We're not going for tennis, Adelaide. <laughs> <laughs> Fuck them. <laughs> um, yeah, I would say as a fan, um, heart. I'm going to say heart, not city, because of how things have changed. But that heart period, because I knew they didn't deserve to beat us, mm. and they felt fake. That's and, and a, like, that's I a knew, real. That's the, that's a derby. That's yeah, I think I think a it's derby. a derby. I think yeah. I think when we're talking, I think the Melbourne derby is a proper yeah, yeah. derby. Whereas Sydney's more of a rivalry. You know, yeah. Obviously, the big cities, most successful teams. What game stands out to you the most in terms of the pressure, the nerves? <sighs> you could just feel it around the change rooms. Was there one specific game where you thought, "Oh, it's do or die." Um, semi final against Sydney 2018. Is that the Antonis goal? That's the Antonis goal. What a that is that was arguably the best A League game I've ever seen. Yeah, that was fuck. That was something else that night, that day, everything. Um, what do you do after you win a semi final? Are you allowed to uh, go out? Um, to be fair, we were cooked, like everybody was drained. Uh, we got back to the hotel. And we had, you know, the typical hospital food that you have after games, you know. Mm. And and the boys said, nah. Anyway, we ended up ordering like 100 pizzas of <laughs> at Domino's, I think it was. And it took ages for them to arrive. And half of the boys just said, I'm just going to bed. Like we, we, Everyone had flown up with their families and they were all waiting in the lobbies for us. And we just went, nah. Yeah, fuck them <laughs> we'll kids. see you tomorrow. Fuck my kids. That's no, great. So that game, everyone was just emotionally and physically drained. Yeah, everyone was just drained. Everyone was – it was so emotional in every aspect. You know, you look at the 90 minutes, you know, a nine goal, the 10 seconds to go. Um, then obviously everything that happened in extra time with the red cards and it was just, yeah. If you guys are listening and you haven't watched that game, I'm sure it's on YouTube, go watch it. Like, it was – one of the most shocking, unique games I think I've, I've ever seen. Like, I really couldn't... I was at home. I remember who I was watching it with, whatever. I could not believe what I was watching. Did I, you tear up, do you think? I didn't tear up. Like, What about when you saw Terry Antonis' face after? No, nah, I didn't tear up. I've never teared up over... Vi- I love victory. I, I'm a, I say former member. My cousin was a drummer for the Terrace, so we were there every week. Oh, that reminds me. Did you have any... What was it like when um, the fan culture went downhill at the club? Were players complaining? Were, like, were people around the club complaining? You know, when all the bands started coming in, no flares, no this, no that, uh, banning people from watching a game for five years. How was it when the A-League fan culture shifted? Could you feel it? Could the players yeah, feel it? 100%. So what was said... You don't have to say who said it, but what was said from inside the club? I think from a sort of from a football side like players we were sort of shielded a little bit away from it yeah <clears throat> sort of they didn't really want us getting involved with what was happening um but you could definitely feel it in the stadiums like it was yeah like so it, were, it, were the players murmuring like oh, we got yeah nothing, yeah we they'd got... be definitely asking questions and again you know like rash what you said about sort of letting them know what's happening so you sort of try to navigate 
to try and sort of just just focus on what we have to do. Because if they speak up, what's going on? Yeah, they're in trouble. But you could feel it, like you know. I remember going to Western Sydney away. It was my first ever away trip, and they used to make us warm up at the old Parramatta Stadium in front of the RBV. Oh God! And I remember. Oh, yeah. It's my first game. It's New Year's Day. It's the second game, actually. New Year's Day. And the keeper coach goes, stand behind the goal for when the boys do shooting. Oh. <laughs> so I go there and I just start seeing things coming. And I go, what? It's coins and bottles and everything in between. And you could feel like an energy coming. And then security was just go, just make think you should go. <laughs> <laughs> Shouldn't stand here. I'm sorry. Jesus like. And um, and then you know you go to Adelaide as well, and you'd feel that hostility, the environment, the atmosphere, and then all of a sudden, like that, it just went away. Wow! And you just wouldn't feel that. You wouldn't feel intimidated going to Sydney or going to Adelaide, going to Wanderers. Was Wanderers the most intimidating? Surely. Oh yeah. Surely there oh, was yeah. a period there where we, we weren't allowed to leave the change room. Well, there would be security standing in front of the change room, not allowing us out. Like we would finish games, we would be playing games, and we'd have like ride police behind us because the benches were plastic chairs at the time. So you would sit down and you would just get in your ear. You'd sit down on the bench and you'd get in your ear, like the fans. That like, close. Isn't like, like the member section, it's like the family section. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry that you had to go through that. But what I will say is, that's what we want. Why would you be sorry? It's part of the game. No, but it's like, it's, it's just a kit, man. What's he? <laughs> like, <laughs> fuck me. Like, you know, but I get it because it's, and, and that's the essence where a lot of the A-League, I call them A-League snobs. They call me a Euro snob, I call them A-League snob. They can't take any criticism about the A-League or whatever. And I know it doesn't help if we're getting on here, and but every guest we've had has been, or an integral part of the A-League. So I don't know what they're talking about. But anyway, that's the reason why I stopped going mm. was because I just didn't feel that tension. I didn't feel that hostility. We were saying about pregame stuff. I said, when I was, maybe it's because I've grown up, but when I was younger, I was shitting myself. I was just thinking- Before I'm, a derby. Imagine we get to the point, which is potential, the way we're going, we're going to get te- tennis rules for crowds where like a <laughs> yeah. goalkeeper is about to take a goal, goal kick- and everyone has to go. Shh, shh, yeah, quiet. yeah. <laughs> they're going to take a penalty, and the, the, if the person the person hears a noise in the crowd, they're like, "Yeah." About to take a well, I've had I've had parents say, "Ah, uh, language," and I'm thinking, yes. I go, "Mate, first of all, I'm in the north end. What are you <laughs> doing here? Like, move." And again, I, it things seem more intense when you're younger, when you're 15, 16. But I remember going, and and. Tuna, just everyone would listen to what he would have to say. We're all just standing there like that. And there was another guy called Doria, uh, but I think something happened there. But there was one game where he cracked it at us for something about not supporting hard enough or, or something. They were going around, get, get, people were giving money out. I was giving money out. Like, it was just different. It was just like you listened to them. It was like, oh, shit, like I got my ticket in here. I better do my part. I used to have my top off, turn around and <laughs> yell at people for not chanting. Me, what the fuck am I going to do? Little 15 year old who weighs 50 kilos. What the fuck with fucking a monobrail? What well, am I going to do, bro? How crazy is this, right? Like in Argentina, you go to games when I first w- was there, when we would go rush, and there was fans, right? From both teams in Argentina. Then it got to the stage where already at that, at, at that time, they were separated, you know? Certain fans from one club can't sit with the other. Then it got to a stage where it was just fan, just home fans, home fans yeah. only. They do that you know? in, in Scotland. And then when we used to go to games and there was their way fans, we had to wait in the stadium half an hour until they have left the oh, suburb, yeah. and then we could get released from from the hometown. Yeah, it's you know? it's um, it gets where like that's that. No, like no way that would be here. You know. Well, it sounds like it got close with the Wanderers, but it wouldn't be that. There would never be just a home. It would completely ruin the A-League. I remember that. One of my first <coughs> games that I played was at Wanderers Away. And I remember that thinking, that was like, this feels like Argentina here. Something. This feels like Europe, like a proper <coughs> game. Like the way they would sing yeah. the flares, like 
they were put on proper forms. That was mad. Bloody Lebos. Hey, do you, can you tell us some stories about fines that comes from like the A League and stuff? Things that because because you, you mentioned to me about the ones that that we spoke about. Other things, anything that about like. Things that players or f- coaches would do. that Because I didn't even know that. So for people that don't have context, last week we talked about how Muskie would get us to... Clear the deck. We, clear the deck, right? We've, we, if we were winning a game 1-0, 2-0, whatever, certain time in the game he'd go clear the deck and we'd go take all the balls off the ball boys and hide them so that then they couldn't restart play quickly. Then Guido said to me that after that we would do that, we would get a fine. The club would get a fine from the league for doing it. I had no idea that that's that kind of thing that that kind of thing happened. Is there any other situations like things that coaches or players that would do that would be okay? That's a fine now from the from the league. I think the one that the most one that happened most often was for not wearing your accreditation. Oh. <laughs> And it was really? like 500 bucks. Oh my God. Yeah, it was something the ridiculous. Lanyard. Yeah, so you'd have to wear your... So we had to, like, a lot of the European boys, they would get it and... Throw sort it. Sort of just toss it out. And then we'd get on the, on the bus and... What's your accreditation? I don't have it. Oh. And the match commissioner would stand like oh, by man. the bus with a clipboard. And if anyone... You just write it down and then you get a letter on Monday. Fuck, that's a nice little <laughs> revenue stream for Man, the league, huh? <laughs> you, mate, you don't have your you don't have your match accreditation. I don't know if you're a player or not. Uh, I'm Carlos Hernandez. Never heard of you. <laughs> Five hundred bucks straight up. It's like when we went to Boleyn. Yeah, yeah, that's what I was thinking of. <laughs> Jerome goes absolutely jobs worth. <laughs> Jerome goes, Oh Gav, you're not gonna they're gonna not gonna let you in. Okay, don't worry, man. I've done this a million times. Always take mine. You know, go to the way. Go to a, like a different field. A different club, yeah. And what did that guy say to me? And he goes, mate, he goes, are you playing tonight? No. Oh, you can't come in. And Gavin goes, what? Are you serious? He goes, oh, I've, I've done it before. And the guy goes, no, nah, mate, rules have changed last year. He goes, so, so, so wait, you have your accreditation for So Thunder. always yes. I would go with my MPL. MPL pass. Okay. MPL pass. And normally, <clears throat> wherever I'd go, I'd walk in. Oh, have you got it? Yeah, here. And straight through. And yep. this is the first time ever I got pulled up. Yeah, it's, 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 I guess it's, um, I don't know. People just take their job seriously. So you have to pay an entry, you're saying? Yeah. Yeah. Which is how much? 15, 15 bucks. bucks. For the Veneto Club. Yeah. yeah. They got enough money there. Um, I was going to jump the fence, but I couldn't with my knee. Well, if you didn't have a sore knee, would you have jumped the yes. fence? Yes. Cool. Yes. <laughs> I could see him doing that. Yeah, I've jumped the fence a few times. Fuck. Yeah. Sometimes it's part of the culture. Um, Guido, um, <coughs> we'll wrap soon, but <coughs> that I yeah, I'd, I'd love to be around when. Well, I wouldn't love. I'd hate to be around when that was going on with the fan culture because the players, as much as you protect them, you can't you can't blind them or deafen them from what's going on in the stadiums. I remember there used to be times where me and my friends would almost have to pick a side. Are we going on level three to protest? Or are we staying with the BWB down there? And we'd go up because that's where the cool cool kids went. But little things like that. Surely the players are looking thinking, fuck, it's empty today. But oh, I guess yeah. they got a job. They got to get on with it. But Were you doing a bubble through COVID and all that? Oh, Were you yeah, in that? Yeah, that was horrible. That was horrible. That would have been that horrible. Was... Games would have been on, then off, then on, then off. Yeah, we had the... I remember when I think we ended up doing... The two week quarantine period. I think we ended up doing it like four or five times across like a year. What you're just by yourself for two weeks at a time? Yeah. So we would like we did the um we we were in Wellington when that got announced. Oh. So we were like I remember I remember I was in the change room. I finished setting up, and the prime minister finished the press conference. Now um, that impacts us. So the, the boys, the bus pulls up and I grab trimmers and and I think Brebsy was the head coach or Carlos or maybe. Anyway, and I said, look, this has just come out. Maybe we should mm. see if we can get out before. Yeah, yeah. So he goes, okay, look, let's just let's not say anything to the boys. Let's just do our research, see what we can do and then we'll make a decision. And then you hear the doctor yell out, what the fuck is going on? And all the boys, what, 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 what? And then he just, 
we tried to get out um, that's like within an hour, but obviously there wasn't enough time. Far out. And yeah, there was that. There was the failed attempts to get into Sydney for to finish the hub, which was. Oh, were what you, about you stressing yeah. for your job? Um, because obviously surplus the requirements. You're more stressing about just getting on with it, yeah, yeah. because it was so difficult without then actually worrying about what the long term future of the mm. league was going to be. Because we were tossing back and forth, like we went <coughs> within the, like we we got we came in on like on a Monday, Monday afternoon they said to us maybe tomorrow you have to fly to Sydney, and then like two hours later like everyone back to Amy, oh. like eight thirty o'clock at night it. to get on a bus, and that'd be way harder. For, I'm sorry if this sounds stupid, but that would be so much harder for you than a player. Why? Because a player just. Footballers are robots. All you got to do is tell them when to be somewhere, and that's it. Mm. Imagine packing. I'm packing. Oh, that. Yeah, yeah. 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 There, that, there was no opportunity because <sighs> I remember leaving Amy Park at like seven o'clock, and I got home sort of seven thirty ish, and then I got a call saying we're leaving in an hour. Get back to Amy. See, fuck out, man. I mean, so it was just that. like just grab everything and just just on that. I spoke to someone the other day that said that they were. Um, at Storm at the time, and they were nine months yeah. in a bubble. Just so playing. that's where we were so playing the uh, worst sport in the world for nine months. He, he told me that two players re- reti- stopped playing because of that. Completely yeah. stopped playing the sport because they were like, "I can't, I can't deal with it." They I left think. like two months before us, and we oh. st- stuck around in Melbourne. You know, within we're starting restarting the league, and and then we ended up in the same predicament. Luckily for us, it was only I think five weeks that we were. In Sydney for it, but the process of getting there was was. <sighs> Will your change in in during that period of COVID would have changed so much of what you could use um, water bottles. I remember when I was training, like uh, yeah, everyone had their own water bottle, and I'm sure you would have had certain things you yeah. were like changed <laughs> so much that you were so used to. Good point. Mm. Um, that like I remember in football it was like okay, you got to take your kit home now, and you got to wash it, and um. If we're in the like standing around in the circle, let's just make sure we're a little bit distant when we're doing the team talk. Well, yeah, I used yeah. to remember the team talk. They used to, each person have to have a separate chair for, and and social distance. What the yeah, hell? like, but they're chair. tackling each other on the field and you know doing these at corners. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you know, and they're worried about. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So were there certain things like that that you were like that they came to you and were like, well, look, you got to do this differently compared to you've always yeah, been yeah, doing. Yeah, 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 yeah. There was so much. Was the boys um, taking their kit home? No. We still no, nah, we still did everything for him. Actually, just bottles, side, side bottles? note, different. We, but yeah. we always did different. Like we, okay. every player had numbers on the bottles, regardless. Yeah. yeah. How, how's this, bro? You know, when, when I was in the K League, right? So, actually, even the bigger clubs <laughs> have this: that you take your own kit home and wash it. Really? That's that. A nah. professional level, you take your own kit home, you wash it. They, when I got there, they're like, yeah, it's normal. You take your kit home and wash it. Then they text you that night which kit to bring, whether it's yellow, whether it's white, whether it's blue. Oh, no. That crazy. doesn't what sound about, good. What about crazy? beer? I've got a question. That doesn't um, sound good. When, you, when you're doing the kits, right, is it done by ten, like training nights or training days? Is it done by numbers? So everyone goes, okay, Rash is number 17. You've got to get shorts number 17. 16. Okay. <laughs> Have you yes, got all that done? No. Or is it like, I'm, easy I'm a latte. Because <laughs> I remember like at certain clubs, it's like, oh, all the socks in the middle, boys go no, grab that. Everything, every every single item is numbered. Yeah. So everything. And what about socks, towels? Yep, everything's numbered. Okay. So from. Because I think that, that changes definitely at levels. <coughs> playing of course. Oh, yeah, you know? for sure. I was just going to ask, what's the go with people now cutting the back of the sock? Oh, yeah. Does that mean you've got to get rid of the socks every time? Every single time? Every match, yeah. So whoever does that, you have to get rid of them. And there, there's players that don't even have big calves that are doing it. I know. It. Was, there th- I know was there something that came in, Guido, that didn't last long, but there was like a little period of it? Like a um, trend? Yeah, like a small trend that came in and didn't last are you dealing with the play shin pads? Um, yeah, there was a point where I took them. Okay. Oh, and, and we would, yeah. Talk yeah. about, but that. Oh, but we would barely touch them. They were yeah. just literally like in a pile, and then 
the worst yeah. smell in the world was coming home uh, after a game and and taking and just smelling your own brew. But no, no one wears shin pads now anymore. Yeah, they wear USB sticks. They were the, the yeah. little. <laughs> so during training, no shin pads now. Uh, not, not anymore. There never like was that pro hey, level. Hey, be you know? honest. Did you ever? Did you ever know that your shin pad smelled real bad, but you just have had a closer whiff just to hell yeah, just to confirm. <laughs> I would vomit at the smell of other people's, but mine, I was like, oh, it's bad. What about... Um, but it's good. <laughs> what about, for example, because in Argentina... It's like a good fart. We always... <laughs> we always use, use vendors, right? So the bandages... Oh, yeah. Mm, were there players that used boxes. the bandages um, or maybe under their kits had certain singlets and stuff, stuff like that? Yeah, you had players that wore... That would wear singlets or even the grip socks. Yeah. You'd have like... That patch... Is different. that... that, is that Vicks? Vicks, yeah. I always wonder what it was. What about special undies? Anyone? Any G strings? <laughs> no. <laughs> no, but anyone no, wear we, like, oh, every week my game day undies. I had that. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah. We, we would, we would like, if a player had a particular preference yeah. that <laughs> wasn't. Was say something else. <laughs> <laughs> if you had a massive cock, <laughs> <laughs> we would get him double XL. <laughs> <laughs> you know, Bonds, double XL, if you had a massive <laughs> cock. If he was on the shorter side, like a Jerome or something, then we would get him. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, man. Keep going. <laughs> Oh, man, that's changed my outlook on my job now. <laughs> yeah, now. <laughs> we could have done that. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, what size are you? Yeah, right, get that. <laughs> yeah, double X on. No, no, you're not. It's part of the onboarding when you get to the... You've got to go, go through the kit room. Yeah. Dick measurement. Yeah, all right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, all good. Yeah. <laughs> what about Guido? G'day, mate, I'm Guido. <laughs> 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 hey, so he's... A He's, he's on the smaller side, um, musky. <laughs> <laughs> Did you at Victory have the bins where all the players would throw their yeah. throw their kids? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. yeah, yeah, we had a <laughs> four or five of them. Yeah, <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> like shaking his hand before you have to do it as well. Yeah, like, musky, musky I've got to tell you about the dick sizes, mate. What's the rule? <laughs> sorry. Okay, so for his is massive. <laughs> <laughs> Right, good. <laughs> good to know. I'll play him left wing. <laughs> good to He'll know. Yeah. Chuck him in a few Viagras. <laughs> Tell the strength and conditioning coach he's got extra weight. <laughs> Load management for Rash. <laughs> and he's the mastermind behind it all. <laughs> Everyone's cock sizes. <laughs> all right. Well, well, just at least, at least six inch, seven inch, three inch. <laughs> Oh God! Guido's doing the fucking um, undies like that. We'll wrap. Sizes. We'll wrap up soon. But <laughs> Rash was telling me, "Are you the kit man for the Socceroos?" No. Okay. On the seventeens. Oh, is that national team? They're not the Ollies, are they? Ollies, Joey's, Joey's. Mm. What's the difference with being in a national setup compared to, I guess, a club setup and their kids? Like what's what, what's the difference there? Mainly, uh, yeah. I mean, the players, I guess, expectation is a bit lower, like in terms of what, yep, they use. Um, you know, they don't really sort of complain about anything. They sort of just get on with it. That's probably like the biggest sort of difference. It's just that expectation of, you know, once you get to a first team environment, you're pretty much getting everything and anything. Yep. Whereas you're a bit younger, you're a bit more limited in what. Sort of you get at your club and sort of what you're used to using or wearing or asking for every day is you know really. What big. about what about different manufacturers? Was it you know from because Victory was we were Reebok, then we were Adidas, now we're Macron. Is there one you prefer to work with? Or I'm assuming Adidas had the biggest selection of things. Yeah, it was actually very. Limited. Adidas was. Probably you get okay. better stuff from the smaller brands, no? Oh, maybe. Adidas now. No? Adidas by far. Really? Yeah. By f- like but it was still Not limited. even close. Um, it was limited in... You wouldn't get like a big range to pick from. Yeah. But within every item you had choices. Because that's because but the smaller clubs... With the big brands are all templates. That's what I was. Yes, that's yeah. what. I, that's what I meant when I said that. Yeah. Like because Victory is a small compared to Real Madrid, for example. Yeah. I was thinking maybe it's better to go with a Macron because mm. then they're going to give you a bit more attention. No. Or no, I, no. 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 Additors were. They, additors looked after us really, really well. 
Yeah. They were very um Adidas victory kit, man. Oh, unbelievable, yeah, was, yeah. yeah. Um yeah, I think like the smaller brands kind of tend to have more options, but the quality's not the same. You know, so maybe, you know, Adidas you could get through a season wearing one thing, whereas perhaps with other brands you'd have Rip. to sort of restock and yeah. How cool is that though? Like doing the Joeys, getting to go all over the world. Like where have you travelled with them? You said Italy before. Yeah, so we were just in we were just in Italy. Um we've done it we did a camp in Turkey, we had the Asia Cup in Sick. Thailand last year. Um we've got a couple of exciting camps coming up. Um, do you do you banter around with the boys? I mean, they're a different age to you. Yeah, but. yeah, and it's always it's very different. Yeah, you know, it's it's yeah. very different to the banter you'd have, you know, in a first team change. Yeah. Um, but yeah, yeah, it's. I mean, they're still in an age where they're a bit shy coming into the environment. Yeah. You know, a lot of them. It's the first time they ever travel away from their families. Yeah, they that, travel yeah. away overseas. Yep. Mm-hmm. And then all of a sudden, then they're sort of thrust into an international competition. Yeah. So. You know, they're sort of a bit more standoffish. A little. It's not considered a full time job, I'm assuming. Yeah, no. no. So, people have said from research that I've done. Last last question, I guess. Um, the pay was it different from sort of your first year to the last, and then how does it work with? I mean, obviously, I'm not going to ask figures, but how does it even work with? Joey's because I know players get paid to play international football, but it's a very small amount. Is that the same for the staff? Um, yeah, so you, you get paid sort of based on how long you're away for. Okay. How long, however long a camp is, you sort of get paid for that time. Yep. Okay. Um, yeah, okay. But Victory was a full-time nine-to-five wage. Yeah. 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 Nine to five. Uh, nine to I nine. I wish. <laughs> I wish. Nine p.m. to nine p.m. Um. <laughs> Literally just... <laughs> <laughs> yeah. What okay. about Guido? How did you get into the jo- the Joey setup? Was that just um, being known? Yeah, I guess you know they were at the time. Obviously, once the pandemic sort of ended, none of the national teams had come together for it was like a two three year period. Mm. So they were starting from from scratch. Mm. Um, and you know, I had a sort of couple of conversations, couple of phone calls. And Is that you reaching out, or they're coming a to bit you? Bit of both. Yep. Yeah. And then sort of the opportunity came up and, you know, I really liked, I really liked, you know, the change I needed that. Yeah. It was nice to sort of get a different outlook, I guess, on on football. And, yeah, it was. Um, I've got one more, actually, for Guido. Yeah, go one more. What was, because I feel like the kit man, there's no real, no one really teaches you how to do anything, you know. It's all kind of. Oh, well, I'm just going to do it the way I am. Did you notice throughout your period at Victory, you sort of changed things around, tried a few things, you know, laid out the kits a certain way and then yeah. grew over time? Or was there, was it from the manager saying, hey, we, I want you to do this. This is what I want the set out to be. <coughs> How did you go about that? It was, it was all just trial and sort error. of my first year. I just sort of kept doing what um, the guy before me had been doing. Yeah. Just sort of stuck to the same just get more of an idea of, of the job. Yeah. And then the second year, it just became more how I like to set things up. Yeah. You know, you, you know, lucky to visit a lot of clubs around the world and see yeah. how they worked, how they did things and sort of take ideas from all of them. Yeah. Um, and then you sort of then narrow it down and try to improve year yeah. on year, you know, change different things yeah. every year to either make it better or worse. Because I, yeah. I think I, me as a player, I've definitely in my past been like, reached out to the kit man and be like, hey, man, can, can you do this a slight differently? Or like, I had this experience, can you start doing this, you know? Were there ever conversations with players that requested... What? <laughs> what, are you, what are you asking them to do, bro? Relax, big shot. Well, like, if I was custom, coming to a hit, No, no, like, if the kits weren't out on, on game day, you know, and they were all just on the, on the physio table, like, hey, man, do you mind hanging them up? Oh, fuck, you asked that? <laughs> They're probably thinking, I get paid two euros a day (laughs) (laughs) to do this. Yeah, I mean, it's... I don't know. I think I got one more, I promise. You definitely would know Kitmans from other clubs in the A-League. Bro, this is what I was going to ask. Yeah. Uh, What's the question I want to ask? I guess it's sort of... 
Victory seems the biggest and the best. Have you heard horror stories from them from what they've had to deal with being probably smaller clubs? They've told oh, yeah. you stuff like that? Yeah. But, I mean, the thing is that what I figured out, or we've all, and we speak about it often, yeah. is that sort of everyone is in the same situation. Yep. Everyone has the same problems. Everyone is getting their kit late. Everyone's yep. players are giving stuff away. That's everyone. a massive thing. Yeah. So everyone has the same problems, just on a different scale. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, Sorry, Gold Coast United. <laughs> well, I feel like that's like players too. Like it's getting to the winter time, and the boys are wondering when are we getting our rain jackets? Like why haven't mm-hmm. they come around? It's getting cold. You know? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And there's always like we used to have a a, a, uh, a, a group chat on WhatsApp, like all the guys around the league. Really? And yeah. yeah. Oh, and, that's mad. <coughs> and there would always be someone that would pop up and they're going, "Hey, look at this guy." Yeah. Or you know, sort of, "Hey, listen, I'm coming to. We're going to Brisbane for a week, and you guys give us." This or that, or that's cool. Yeah, like a kit man union. Do, you, do you have a kit man union in the sense of like, obviously you've worked, you've played against teams like Liverpool, you've played against ACL teams, all this that you build a connection. There's a bit of a rapport there that you're like, okay, now if I want to go watch a training session of Liverpool when I fly to Liverpool, this guy can help me get into there. And yeah, yeah, I've, that's one of the things I always did was whenever we'd <clears throat> go on break. I'd always line my holiday up, holiday up with somebody that I've met through football. Awesome. Yeah. So we would go visit, like we've been to, you know, been to Liverpool a few times. Like I still keep in contact with their kids. And you've man. seen their setup, how they do the kits and stuff. Yeah, yeah. Well, like we went to oh, Mel- I mean. Melbourne for a so day. Much off them too. Yeah. Like spent a, I went to the US, spent a week with the LA Galaxy, spent Mad. some time at Real Madrid, um, Atletico Madrid. Um, yeah, that's just. What blew like your mind the most in terms of was there anything that you saw that thought, well, okay, these guys, obviously football-wise are on a different level to victory, but preparation-wise, did you see anything where you thought, oh, this is another level? Yeah, so when when, when Real Madrid, they were here in Melbourne yeah, for... Yeah, I high five Ronaldo. Uh, some tour, yeah, he yep. was around. And um, anyway, I managed to get in contact with the kit man somehow. I don't I can't remember how we met and... <coughs> I, they, they let me spend the week with them that they were in Melbourne for. Sick. And they took me through into the change rooms. Whilst the t- so the team was training and they were setting up the change room for after training. And um, they said the players get a brand new training kit for every single session whilst they're on tour. <laughs> so they were training twice a day, every day, including game day. And so they would give them... They said that they travelled with like three ton of kit, and three and which ton was ju- which was just for the Melbourne leg. Then they would get they were, I think they were going to China afterwards, and they were getting like another delivery. This is where well, it gets like, the rich well, people, man. Like that's come like on, the bro, Argentinian that's national team. Did you hear about that, Kilo? The Argentinian national tra- team travelled with like hundred kilos of yerba. <laughs> yeah, the stuff like for like the Ita- the Italian national team travelled with like an espresso machine. Yeah, like, well, like on, on wheels. Argentinian, and they got their own barber to come in, and they chopped their hair every game, like before the games. He'll do all the teams, all the players. I suppose you want to feel like you're at home as well. This summer, <laughs> bro, like three that. tons. But yeah, yeah. Just yeah. like they, they, they had going to do two sessions in a day. Like, yeah, and like that's thing, all the players wore, and, and like they would get like a stash of, you know, like jumper, t-shirt, long sleeve yeah. t-shirt. Impression, like three quarter pants. Was the pants attention short. to detail from the kit man any different from what you do, or pretty much the same? They were a lot more um, on the run. Yep. So, like, they perhaps they gave the players more options, but it was a little more. Like, here it is. Yeah. Here it is. Take Sh- or leave it. Sure, yeah. okay. Surely they had <laughs> more staff members doing kits than they had four. Yeah. yeah right. In Melbourne and uh, Atletico wow. Madrid had had the same. Yeah. Four. Uh, for how many four. players? Oh, I, I, 23 or something would it have been? I don't know Sport how many would have come. But they, they had two on pitch, two in the change room. Far and then they man. would, you know, obviously after training, there'd be a couple cleaning boots, a couple loading yeah. the van, a couple just looking after players. So when a player like rips their jersey or whatever on the field, it, you've got to run back in the room, grab their new one, yeah. bring Even it. blood. Well, it, uh, but blood we would always keep. We would always, I would always keep... Bench two side. or three blood kits on the bench yep. in case it happens. Oh, okay. And then... Okay. What about boots? Then, Anyone, like, needed a boot change, like... 
Oh, he sat as players, I think you take that to the to the bench if you sure, wanted studs, absolutely. you know. Yeah, yeah but it's, we used to have Matty Del Pierre. He remember he had the injury the first year he was here with us. He missed yeah, like half remember. a season. Yeah, 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 I can't remember what it was. And um, he could only wear one pair, which were like Nike CTRs, I think. And Nike stopped making them, so we had to scour like the world to get two pairs because he was like a size thirteen. <laughs> and we couldn't get them anywhere. <laughs> and we managed to source like two pairs from like the US. and Like a reseller? Yeah, because we couldn't track them down. We couldn't find them anywhere. We, they were, and um, yeah, we, he had to wear those two pairs of boots for like an entire season. So like for training and game day. So we would like, games would finish and we would take them back. And pretty much repair the boot during the week. What? Just to get them ready for the game. Repair the boot as in washing them very carefully. Oh, no, they would split. Like studs would break. So you would have to like clean out the grass. <laughs> let them dry. Glue them together. Clamp them. And do that during the week. Get through to the game. And do it again. <laughs> Was that because he just loves CTRs? No, no. He could, he could not because of his injury. because of his injury. Uh, just he, he could not. Hold on, but what's <laughs> it? It's just because he liked it. Yeah. Hold on, <laughs> like, nah, this is ridiculous. Rate. Hold on, what's his cock size? <laughs> <laughs> no, but um, he's carried more weight. I'm, I'm right sorry. Right that sounds it. that sounds silly because you're telling me that it was that boot was so imperative to his injury. They couldn't find another boot. He, he we got in everything we could, and he just could not. That we could not, he just would not feel comfortable in him. Some lottos would have worked, but you laughed at me. Yeah, lottos would have been good, <laughs> but he couldn't, wouldn't have been able to pass <laughs> the ball straight. <laughs> Damn, so wow. Yeah. So, so and, you're and in there, like, gluing little parts of the boot back together. Yeah. Got the hairdryer out, drying the boot. Yeah. Like, I remember yeah. we had one player in, 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 in the Champions League one game. He brings in his boot, and it's completely ripped open. Like, completely gone. It's, like, hanging by a thread it's on the during back. During the game. Yeah. And he goes, do you think you can get them ready for the second half? <laughs> He's a long gone. He right sounds now. like in like Mike. Out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. In like Mike when he can't play because yeah. his <laughs> shit is ripped. They're doing what the kids do, the laces around the bottom. Uh, yeah. yeah. Jesus. Oh, well, we could go on for hours, but I think we got a decent amount. Guido, thank you so much for sharing your journey and the stories. We really appreciate it. Like we said from the start of this pod, guys, we wanted to get people on here that had an insight that no one else can offer. And I think we've, we've done that really well today with you. So thank you for your time. Thank you for coming. Good luck with your future endeavours and the Joeys and everything. And yeah, man, it was a sick ep. Oh, I'm, I'm, I'm fed. I'm fed. I'm done. I'm going to go home, measure my dick, and um, uh, I'll let you know. And uh, <laughs> guys, like, comment, subscribe, all of that. Keep following. We have... Some more incredible guests coming. Uh, I don't want to say anything. That's all I'm going to say. So keep that there. Keep tuned in. Uh, boys, thank you. Suited and booted. We out.